Now let's talk about game theory, what it actually is. Most of the questions you'll be given will have some sort of a payoff matrix, as this is called, it's a table like this, and you'll mostly be asked to find what's called the Nash equilibrium. Now there's two easy steps you can do to solve for it. What we'll do is we'll sort of talk through why they even make sense, but that way having them, you'll sort of become procedurally fluent at it. So um, before that though, let's talk about what this thing even means. The games we assume for microeconomics here are what are called simultaneous games. So you play them together. What that means is, unlike a game of chess where one person goes and then the other person goes and then you go again, unlike that, this is kind of more like rock, paper, scissors where both players are going simultaneously and then sort of the outcome is based on what they both do. So here, the two players of the game, let's say here we have an example of a game, the two players here are Eminem and Drake. Now, these words over here, the two options uh, next to Drake, these are called strategies. So Drake can either release a single or release an album. Those are his two options. It's kind of like rock, paper, scissors. What he can do is he can either do release a single, release an album. Those are his two options. Eminem, his two options, his two strategy choices are he can make a video or he can do a concert. You know, So those are his two options. Notice that they don't have to be the same options but they certainly can be. Most examples you'll see will probably have the same options, but they don't have to be by any means. Now, let's say uh, Drake releases a single and Eminem does a concert, right? So if that happens, well then go to that row where it says single and that column where it's concert, and this is where you end up, this three and four, that, that cell. Now, the red number, the one before the slash, is always the row players, payoff. Kind of like how many points they get, if you will, the profits. Um, so here, Drake gets three, Eminem gets four, if they end up there. Notice though that one thing is, these for this game, any game here really, it's not really gonna be a winner and a loser. You're not really gonna have a winner and a loser, because these games are more of, a, you know, you're just trying to maximize your own profits. You're trying to maximize your own points. You actually don't even care about the other guys. If you had to choose between you getting 80 and the other guy getting zero versus you getting 81 with the other guy getting 100. In the real world, you might say, oh yeah, I'd rather do this because that way I'm 80 more than the other guy. But according to our assumptions of game theory, no, no, you'd rather, if you had the choice, you'd rather do this and get 81 for yourself because you'd rather have that one extra. You don't care about the fact that you're now 19 less than them instead of 80 more. You don't care about the other guy, basically. And that's why, you know, as you'll see, that's incorporated into our rules here. So, now that we know, understand how this works, what these mean, you know, there's four possible outcomes of the game. Uh, and those are these four cells, if you will, these four boxes. So the, the Nash equilibrium is the one where we'll sort of end up, as you'll see. That's sort of what's expected to happen if both people are trying to maximize their own profits, assuming that the other guy's also trying to maximize their own profits. So, Here's how we can do this. Let's say we're Drake. Let's say we're on Drake's staff right now. We're, we have to help him make decisions. Here's what we'd be thinking. We're, we're again, we're trying to choose between single or album. Which one should we do? Well, here's, the, here's how we're gonna analyze it. Let's say, suppose, that we have some intel saying that Eminem's doing the video. In that case, in that instance alone, what would we wanna do? Well, if we know that he's definitely doing the video, you can almost block this off. It's almost like you've narrowed the world down to just this first column. If Eminem's doing the video for sure, we know that we are either going to get five if we do the single or ten if we do the album. So in that case, what's better? Well, the album's better. Five beats ten. So here's what we know so far. If we know, so if we know that Eminem's doing the video, then we'll want to do the album. So we want to do the album. But that's, you know, conditional on that video, that he's doing the video. Now, the only other case is, what if Eminem was doing the concert? Well, in that case, it's kind of like you're blocking this off. The world's narrowed down to Eminem doing the concert. And in that case, the single gets you three, and the album gets you seven. So in that case, again, the album is still better for us to do than compared to the single, because seven's better than three. So in that case, we'd want to do that. So notice, if you're thinking about the overall steps that we did, that's step one over here one column at a time. That's why we looked at, oh, in this case, and then in this case. This is where we're role-playing as the role-player. It's weird because we're role-playing as the role-player, but we're kind of starting with, if M&M, &M, if 
did a video, but we're, we're thinking as Drake. So either way, one column at a time, we, we want to circle the highest number before the slash, because the numbers before the slash represent that role player, Drake, right? The red numbers. So we're only looking at the red numbers for now. We're ignoring all the black numbers here. So just looking at the red numbers in, in that first column, 10 beats 5. In that column, 7 beats 3. So you're never comparing these two or these two, you know? So either way, that's how you do it. Now, notice in this case, though, if you've been listening carefully, you might have noticed that Drake basically always wants to do the album. In, in either case, regardless of what I'm, in, I'm doing, in both cases, one at a time, the album was better than the single. So in that case, we're going to say that the album, doing the album, is a dominant strategy. for Drake. So if any one of your two options, strategies, again, if any one of your two strategies is always better, that's a dominant strategy. That's, that's why there's an asterisk here. So if, if you're circling, when you're doing that circling, if it's the same single row, essentially what you're doing here is one column at a time, you're basically picking a row, right? Five or ten, you're basically picking between the first row or the second row. So if it's the same row, the bottom the second row is what we picked every time, that means that that's a dominant strategy. That row, that album, is a dominant strategy for Drake. We're halfway done. The other half is basically the same thing, but now role playing as the other guy. So now here we have to be careful because now instead of one column at a time, we're going one row at a time. And now we're only looking at the black numbers. We're ignoring all the red numbers. We're only looking at the numbers after the slash and we want the best one, one row at a time. And so essentially in each row, we're picking which column is best because the columns what Eminem would be choosing between concert or video. So if we're Eminem and we somehow know that Drake's doing the single, what's better? The video gets us two, but the concert would get us four. So just in that one row, four is better. So we'd want to do the concert. The only other case is what if Drake did the album? Well, then it's nine or seven. And in that case, actually, the nine, so the video is better. So notice in this case, Eminem, in one instance, he wanted to do the concert. And in the other, he wanted to do the video. So Eminem has no dominant strategy. And so right off the bat, there is no dominant strategy equilibrium. A DSE, a dominant strategy equilibrium, is only there if both players have a dominant strategy. Then it's called the DSE. And so if even if one of them doesn't have a dominant strategy, there's no DSE. But the dominant strategy equilibrium aside, what's the Nash equilibrium? So even if we don't have a dominant strategy equilibrium, we could still have a Nash equilibrium, and here we do. The Nash equilibrium, long story short, is once you're done doing all the circling, any cell out of the four that has both number circles, which this guy, is a Nash equilibrium. So in this game, if we were starting from the beginning, now that you hopefully understand a little bit of the reasoning behind why these steps even make sense, now you can sort of fluently apply them in each problem and without being thrown off conceptually. So if you're given this problem, all you have to do is do the circling, one, one column at a time, then one row at a time, and then any cell that has both numbers circled, that's a Nash equilibrium, and in the process you'll know if there's any dominant strategies or not and whether there's a DSC or not. Now let's look at another example. Suppose you and your friend are deciding whether to go to Starbucks or Big B, and you, let's say you both like them equally, and let's say these are the numbers. Usually these numbers will be given to you for any problem, and um, let's find the Nash equilibrium. Well, we could just apply the procedure at this point, so one column at a time. So in this first column, so again, we're role-playing as you, so if they're choosing Starbucks, what do you want to do? Starbucks gets you 10, Big B gets you 0. So you'd want to do Starbucks in that case because you don't, you don't want to drink coffee alone. Uh, on the other hand, the only other case, if they're doing Big B, again, you're choosing between 0 and 10. So in this case, though, you'd want to do Big B. So you don't have a dominant strategy because you didn't want to do the same row every single time. We cir circled this row here, this row here. Now, halfway done, now let's analyze what your friend would be thinking. Your friend is thinking, hey, if you do Starbucks, then now we're only looking at the red numbers, by the way. Now we're choosing between the 0 and the 10. Now we're picking a column, and so the best column is the 10 over here, right? They want to do Starbucks in that case. Or if you were doing Big B, again, Starbucks gets them 0, Big B gets them 10, so they'll want to do that. Now, if we look back and try to answer the question, what's the Nash equilibrium, there's actually two different boxes with both numbers circled. So as we just witnessed, it's actually possible to have more than one Nash equilibria. That's the plural of it. So here, there's actually two different Nash equilibria, so we're not restricted to just having one. In fact, there might even be games with zero Nash equilibria. 
By the way, a game of this type is called a coordination game. Usually it's kind of like uh, problems like, should we all drive on the left side of the road or the right side of the road? Philosophically, it doesn't matter as long as everyone's doing the same thing. Uh, so here, really doesn't matter in this case whether you go to Starbucks or, uh, Starbucks or Big V. As long as you're both going to the same place, you both are happy. So that's why there could be multiple Nash equilibria. Finally, let's look at how game theory actually applies to economics. Usually, the game that we look at in economics that's related is called the prisoner's dilemma. It's really just a type of game, and the type being the numbers are kind of arranged in a way where something really funky will happen in a bit. So, let's say we're given this game. Basically, it's a game between Coke and Pepsi. Blue is Pepsi, red is Coke. Let's say they're deciding between should I sell my you know, product at $1 a can or $10 a can? Let's say those are the only two options that they have. Notice though that even though these over here are numbers, one and the 10, we're not really gonna do anything with them numerically. If you look at where they're positioned, they're really strategy options. So treat this no differently than a word that represents the strategy option. So that's just one thing. Those don't go and get into the circling mix. So either way, Let's look at what happened. Let's look at what the Nash equilibrium is. Well, if Coke is for sure gonna set their price at a dollar a can, what's Pepsi gonna wanna do? Well, a dollar a can gets them 10, and $10 a can, they'll only get 5 million, right? Instead of 10 million or something. So, they're better off selling their price at $1 a can and getting 10 million bucks. On the other hand, what if Coke's, you know, really expensive? Well, then Pepsi, if they're also expensive, they'll get, they'll get 20 million, but if they're only $1 a can, they'll get, 25. So again, we're just looking at this column and circling the higher of the two numbers before the slash. So 25 wins. So. Either way, hey, it's the same row that we circled every time. So setting their price at a dollar a can is actually a dominant strategy. It's always better for Pepsi to do that. Now we're halfway done. Now let's, let's look at the other half. If you're Coca-Cola, now just one row at a time. So if Pepsi's for sure setting their price at a dollar a can, you're choosing between 10 or five, which is higher? Well, 10 is bigger, so you're gonna to wanna to do that, which really just means that you wanna do $1 a can. And if uh, Pepsi's doing $10 a can, then Coke wants to, again, they're choosing between 20 and 25. 25 is better, so they're again wanna, gonna to wanna to do $1 a can. So in fact, that column was always picked, right? That column, so that is a dominant strategy now for Coke. And by the way, it's totally symmetric in this case, so that's why we knew that if it was a dominant strategy for them, in this case, it'll be a dominant strategy for them. Either way, both players have a dominant strategy, so we have a dominant strategy equilibrium where they both set it at a dollar a can. That's also a Nash equilibrium. In fact, every dominant strategy equilibrium is also definitely a Nash equilibrium, but not the other way around. Uh, either way, here, the Nash equilibrium is that both parties will set their product at a dollar a can and make 10 million in profits. Doesn't seem like an issue. Notice in all the past games that we might have done or, you know, usually the Nash equilibrium is a good thing. That's usually where both parties are kind of, you know, as, as well off as they're going to be able to be. And here, if we were to compare this with this, this cell with this cell, we can't really say whether one's definitely better than the other because here, yeah, 25 is bigger than the 10, so Pepsi would prefer to be here. But Coke, you know, Coke, this isn't better for Coke, right? So, you know, it's not really a dilemma yet if we're sort of saying, oh yeah, why, why did this end up being the Nash equilibrium instead of this? It's like, you know, who cares? Depends on who you are, Coke or Pepsi. But if you compare it to this cell over here, huh, they both, there's a, an option out there where they both could make $20 million a piece instead of just $10 million a piece. So they both would prefer if you were to switch and go to this equilibrium. But the Nash equilibrium says, even empirical evidence kind of shows that this is what will happen. And uh, this is called the prisoner's dilemma. The name comes from the fact that originally you can, you know, it was kind of used by police to uh, get prisoners to confess. You'd want to confess even though you could technically get more by not confessing. But same thing in economics now. So Pepsi and Coke technically, here's the thing. If they both uh, colluded with each other, that's the word, colluding, and setting $10 a can, it's as if they're a, you know, an oligopoly acting like a monopoly. In that case, you know, they'd be able to set you know, $10 a can, really high price. They're probably selling a very low quantity in that case because the price is so high. But then they can get more money. But what ends up happening is 
Unlike if they were, you know, colluding with each other, each person's kind of thinking, hmm, but if I lower my price, I'll just get so many more customers, so I'll make more, I'll make 25 instead of 20. So each person wants to kind of cheat on the other person, and that's why they end up here, where they both end up getting $10 instead of $20, right? So that's the prisoner's dilemma. Now, to, uh, you know, two companies that are in a sort of prisoner's dilemma com com competition with each other, they could kind of try to tacitly collude, that just means sort of silently trying to collude with each other. Here's the thing though, the government's, government's kind of made it illegal to actually do that. You can't have, you know, a contract saying, I, Pepsi, will, you know, sell Coke, uh, you know, my product at $10 a can, and I, Coke, will do the same thing. You know, those contracts are illegal. That's, that trust between them is illegal, and that set of laws that refers to that is called antitrust law. So antitrust basically makes colluding, or cartels as they're sometimes called, it makes that illegal. Now the only case, the only time where it's possible even for uh, these these firms to kind of sustain collusion over a long period of time is if the game is repeated. So the game needs to be repeated many many times, and then you'll kind of think, oh, okay, you know what, you know, if I'm sort of nice to them and they're nice to me, then we could maybe get more rather than trying to short term screw each other over, but then screw yourself up in the process too. So either way. That's actually called tit for tat, and that's just a strategy you can use if the game is repeated. Most introductory economics classes don't go into that, so we won't worry about that, but that's basically what it is. Now, here's the thing, though. The fact that, you know, they end up here instead of here might seem like a sad thing to us, right? Like, oh, they're, they're only going to make 10 instead of 20. But from the government's perspective, it's actually a good thing, and that's why, in fact, they've made this illegal, and, you know, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, exactly, this illegal, and so that's why if they sort of have a contract and they're trying to do this, so not only does the Nash Equilibrium say that they're going to end up here, it's actually illegal for them to even do this. That's why they're further more likely, because they don't want to break the loss, to end up here. And here's why. If you look at the big picture, if this is your supply and demand curve, perfect competition, again, will produce here a monopoly. You make the MR produces here at this price. And notice a monopoly has all this dead weight loss, right? So if you're the government and if you somehow notice that your, you know, one industry, you know, the soda industry went from a monopoly to a duopoly, now they're competing, well notice they're going to want to have some price competition, right? And that actually lowers the price and that's why oligopolies usually always end up somewhere in between where a monopoly would end up. Monopolies are here, perfect competition is here and oligopolies are somewhere in the middle. So that's why they have some deadweight loss, but it's uh, not as much deadweight loss as a monopoly. That's why, by making this illegal, the government's actually trying to lower the deadweight loss because, hey, if they're here, that's like a monopoly, and it's a lot of deadweight loss. So that's why the government actually has antitrust laws. It's to lower deadweight loss and to make markets more competitive.